In May 1860, the USS Levant, a second-class sloop of war in the United States Navy, was ordered to Hawaii at the request of the Secretary of State for a routine matter of Navy business. After receiving a state visit by King Kamehameha IV at Honolulu, the Levant sailed for Panama on the 18th of September, 1860. It never made port. Did it sink? Was it off a reef in California? Did it find a new uncharted island that rumors said were all over the Pacific? Did the Levant defect to join the budding Confederacy in the South? It was a mystery in America as to what happened to this arm of American foreign policy in the Pierce and Buchanan administrations. But whatever happened to it, the Levant may have played a role in a bit of a political question that we ask today, one about presidential elections. To the editor of the New York Times, January 7th, 1861, in your paper of today, I notice a report of the probable loss of the United States sloop of war Levant. On the departure of the last mail steamer, the Levant had been out only 103 days from Honolulu, Sandwich Islands, for Panama. During the past 10 years, there have been several vessels which have been over 100 days between these two ports. One in particular, in 1852, was 139 days. Considering that fact, and knowing that the months of October, November, and December are the three months most calm on that route, I cannot see any just cause for such conclusions as those stated in your paper. The distance from Honolulu to Panama is 3,764 miles in a direct line. J.H., a reader of the New York Times, wrote that letter. But as the months went on, his views proved too optimistic. The USS Wyoming was sent to look for the Levant and did not find it. A few clues slowly came in. In June 1861, a mast and part of a lower yard arm, believed to be from the Levant, were found near Hilo, Hawaii. Spikes had been driven into the mast as if to form a raft. In July, a small bottle was found off Nova Scotia. It was corked and contained a card that read in part, Pacific Ocean Levant, written by the last remaining three. But the card was damaged when it was removed from the bottle and Parts of the message were unreadable. It couldn't be verified to really be from the Levant. Ten years after the disappearance, a reader contacted the New York Times. He was living in Paris, but he, he said, was one of the survivors of the Levant. Few believed him. The Congress in 1861 passed a law to compensate the widows and orphan children of the officer, seamen, marines, and others who were lost with the ship. There's no telling what really happened, but prior to its disappearance, the sloop had taken part in a conflict that most Americans aren't aware of. But more about that in a bit. I want to talk a bit about the United States Senate. The United States legislative system has two parts, a House of Representatives and a Senate. So does Canada. Well, in Canada, there is much talk now of abolishing their upper house, their Senate. That body goes back to 1867, and it was created to be a body of sober second thought that would curb the democratic excesses of the elected House of Commons. But the system works a little differently than in the United States. Senators, once appointed, serve until they are 75 years of age. When there is an opening, it is filled by the monarch of Canada. The monarch of Canada is the Queen of the United Kingdom, Elizabeth II. But in reality, the prime minister advises the monarch, and that advice is followed. So, in effect, the prime minister appoints senators. When Canada Senate was founded, there was established a qualification of property that still exists. The senator must own $4,000 in property. Now, that meant a lot in 1867, but means little now. But there's still that qualification. But what's really got people upset is the lack of representation. Horribly unfair. The largest province in terms of population, Ontario, and two western provinces that were not populous at the time of their accession to the Federation, particularly British Columbia, are underrepresented. Maritime provinces are overrepresented. British Columbia, with a current population of 4 million, has been historically entitled to six senators, while Nova Scotia, with a current population of fewer than 1 million, has been entitled to 10 senators. Only Quebec, at 24, has a share of senators approximately proportional 
to its share of the total population. So there's talk of reform, maybe giving nine-year terms, or just outright abolition. The New Democratic Party and the Bloc Québécois have called for the abolition of the Senate of Canada. Conservative Prime Minister Stephen Harper has called for reform, but he stated that the Senate must either change or vanish. Vanish? You don't hear that kind of talk in the United States. You don't hear President Obama wishing the Senate would vanish. Well, certainly not, because currently the Senate is held by the same party as he. And you don't hear people calling for the Senate to vanish. Thanks to that 17th, we elected those people. We elect our senators, and so we cherish them. Well, a little. Samita Hudson writes in the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics website, I have heard from three pundit comedians. Maddow, Hannity, etc., both sides of the aisle, now complain about this topic that it makes no sense. A complaint about being only two senators per state. They bring it up with specialists who never talk about why we set it up this way. Maddow, for instance, complained that the balance difference was 1 to 11 between the most populous states in 1778, and it's 1 to 66 today. But that is irrelevant as to why we have two senators per state. You spoke on the House and why they haven't grown with the population, mostly due to the space in Congress. Why is there this current push to question the makeup of the Senate? Well, I mean, I think why there's a question is that it's a bit of a bipartisan issue because Republicans now don't currently control the Senate, whereas on the liberal side, Democratic side, you still have the fact that the Senate is not the most representative body and that Democrats would greatly benefit, perhaps, from a population standard. So so if it's just like, wow, why does one state have more people but still two senators and another state has less people and still two senators, those pundits need to go back to the history books and figure out why. It's not just magic and it didn't just appear today. Senators are representatives of the states rather than the people in the federal republic we are in. As the federal government is a larger presence in our lives, we feel more like Americans than Oklahomans sometimes. It becomes more difficult to understand why this is so. While the framers at the Constitutional Convention did fear kings, the return of a monarch, certainly, there had also been enough experience with state legislatures to fear mob democracy. And that's what a lot of the Constitution is about. Senates, almost everywhere they exist, and they exist all around the world, are always intended to be curbs on the excesses of the popular body the houses. And that's true in the United States. If these pundits are making a comment as to why we no longer need it today, that's a larger discussion. I expect that's what they are. They're jumping right into that discussion without an intro, which is confusing to those of us who study history and know that there's a reason we have a Senate, right? Like it or hate it, there's a reason. You can make a new argument that we should take a second look at these institutions, that in civics classes we learn a lot more about participation and democracy than about the nooks and crannies of republics. And inherent in the Senate is some kind of reversion to property rights, defense of property, representation through property. I mean, it couldn't happen, so it was done with two senators per state, a curb on the House of Representatives. Should we all just say, I wish the Senate was never born? I have a tough time with this one. Without a Senate, I think that there would be a positive in terms that people may feel more represented, that if they and enough of their fellow people agree on something, boom, it's law. Outside of that rare representative that would eschew the two-year term and disagree with her constituents. For the most part, Popular will is law. And that would be fun short term. For instance, after 2008, with no Senate, you would have seen, I believe, a far more radical health care reform program. My suspicion is that Obama would not go single payer because he's not really a radical, but would have moved Medicare down to perhaps 55 and added a public option to the current model. But there would have been no need to negotiate with Max Baucus, Olympia Snow, and Joe Lieberman. The president and his house of his party in majority would have simply passed it in 2009. But the magic wand, which would exist in that type of a system, will go both ways. So if that happened after 2010 now, with voters angry about the economy and spending, a new house would have eliminated the program as they are pledged to do now based on their current position. So she would have had legislation implemented, legislation reversed. 
So the senex, the body of old men from the Latin word, keeps you from doing anything too rash. Everything is slow. Plus, it enforces geographic unity. If in the early days, if you got Matto and Hannity's seeming wish, that would have led to Virginia running most politics. Of course, it was influential in any case in the early times and is now reaching influence again. Government by population alone means large population centers run the country. This was not attractive to the Republican minds of early America. Rhode Island and Delaware are two examples of small states that were sensitive about where they came from because they separated from larger states. Rhode Island didn't participate in the constitutional debate but eventually agreed to the Constitution. The state had been formed to escape religious persecution of Massachusetts. Delaware had escaped the onerous government of Pennsylvania. So the Senate adds, in addition to a little bit of a sobering effect on the House of Representatives, it puts the states back into the federal system as a check on the federal government, especially before the 17th when they were appointed by the state legislatures. Now there's a little less of that. Big cities and towns were places that developed from commerce and were influenced by powerful people. A Senate, in theory, if you have two senators from places like North Carolina and South Carolina and Georgia, in just the same way as you have two senators from Massachusetts and New York and Pennsylvania, you are limiting the effect of these big population centers. The 17th kind of brought some of that back, brought the urban centers back into influence in the federal government because, well, in a lot of states, if you're running statewide, the support of a big population center is going to help you. So once you turn it into election, you brought the, the cities back a bit. I still think that because you have so many states that are wide expanses, rural in nature, Utah, Idaho, Wyoming, Mississippi, Alabama, Kansas, Nebraska, you have the representation of the country as well as the city. Now, an argument on the other side is that we need to change the Senate because representation by states didn't go the way that the framers in the early Congress wanted. There was supposed to be an attempt to make more equal-sized states when they were added to the Union. It was the intention of Congress. It was a suggestion from Thomas Jefferson when they asked him. It was reflected in the size of many states. Mississippi, Alabama, Kentucky, Tennessee, Indiana, Illinois. You'll notice roughly equal size. Texas and California were added by the Mexican War, and in both cases, a local population pushed the Congress to accept the state as they were. And as these two states have become populated states, the unfairness has increased. The filibuster has also made the Senate even more powerful than, say, it was definitely at the founding of the country, and it was prior to the 1830s when it started to be actively used. So one senator has the ability to stop federal legislation in the United States. So a person that might only have been elected by, say, half a million voters can stop federal legislation. So I don't think it makes sense, as, as you're saying, for pundits to just rail against the unrepresentativeness of the Senate without understanding why it's there to help with geographic unity, to help represent all pockets of the country, the country and the city. And there's one other justification for the Senate that I think has appeared with some of the gerrymandering that's gone on in the 1980s with the Democratic Party and now in this decade with the Republican Party, where the House is not necessarily representative either. Congressional districts are fairly large, and parties in various states are able to manipulate the drawing of the districts to get the type of result that they want in many cases. They're better at it now with new computer tools, with better demographics, with better cartography. At the very least, two senators represent a state. And you know where the state lines are, and they're not being redrawn anytime soon. It's an interesting question. I don't think it's a simple one. You could start by eliminating the over excesses of power in the Senate, like the, the filibuster. But I don't think our upper house is going away anytime soon. John Elsey writes, Hey Bruce, I was wondering, has the U.S. ever changed presidents during a war or major conflict? I can't remember any president being defeated while we had a major conflict going on. Well, John, thanks. 
I'll give you the quick answer and then I'll address an interesting set of possibilities. So have we swapped horses, defeated an incumbent during war? We have another example in 2012 of a president being reelected while the war in Afghanistan was going on. Abraham Lincoln said that his victory was due to the fact that voters wouldn't swap horses while crossing streams. He said that to show his humility, that it's not about me, it's just the voters don't like change during a crisis. Of course, we forget that Lincoln made that comment in 1864 when he received the nomination of the Republican Party and not when he was elected, but it's being applied now to elections. In elections in American history, presidents have changed and parties have swapped power during wars. An incumbent president cannot said to have been defeated during what was clearly a war. Was it ever close? It was awfully close at times. 1864, when Lincoln made that remark, McClellan was a strong candidate. Had the Union not prevailed in the Battle of Atlanta, I, th I think the U.S. would have swapped horses. And parties have changed when there were different candidates running for president, but voters have still decided to select a different party. Look at uh, President Obama in 2008. Troops are still in Iraq and Afghanistan, and America switches between the Republican and Democratic Party. It's the reverse when American voters choose Nixon and, over Humphrey and control switches from the Democratic to Republican parties in the middle of Vietnam. Voters have also punished presidents during wars by electing the other party in midterms. 1944 is an example. Not happy with the way the Pacific War is going, other issues, they vote Republicans in. Didn't control the House, but Republicans gained significant amount of seats. 1862. Civil War is going on. Democrats are winning all over the country in those 1862 midterms. 1970. Vietnam is going on. Nixon is president. Democrats have a fairly good midterm. No president, though, is defeated during a major conflict. But Johnson and Truman could be said to have cheated history of an example by not running again, choosing not to run again in elections where political science would have indicated a defeat. So 1950, with the Korean War going on, Truman steps down, Stevenson gets the Democratic nomination and is defeated. 1968, Vietnam going on, Johnson steps down, Humphrey gets the nomination and is defeated. So we're not seeing a lot of evidence in history that American voters won't punish an incumbent during war. Perhaps another conflict could shed some light on this issue. In 1856, the United States ship Levant went on a dazzling voyage from Rio de Janeiro, around the Cape of Good Hope, the tip of South America, to Hong Kong in order to bolster America's presence in Asia. We were actively trading with China, and we wanted to make sure that trade continued. But these weren't the days when you just sent your aircraft carriers to the Gulf and have them arrive in a few days. Naval diplomacy and conflict took time. Months after she sent, she embarks, delivers the U.S. commissioner to China for transportation to Shanghai. The U.S. were at peace with China, now led by the Qing Emperor. European powers in the United States were seeking to renegotiate commercial treaties they had. This effort was led by the British. They wanted the opening of all of China, all the ports, to their merchants, not just a few of them, and an ambassador in Beijing, legalization of the opium trade, the exemption of imports from tariffs. The Qing government refused, refused to renegotiate. In October 1856, Chinese officials boarded a British-registered ship, the Arrow, and removed 12 Chinese crewmen. British diplomats in Canada demanded the release of them and sought redress. Chinese refused, stating that Arrow was involved in piracy. The British contacted France, Russia, and the United States. Let's form an alliance. Let's fight. Let's open the ports in a forceful way. And the French, who had been angered by the execution of one of their missionaries by the Chinese, joined up. War began with France and Britain against the Qing Emperor. The Second Opium War began. The U.S. did not join immediately. Along with Russia, they decided to try to send envoys instead. Sailing off the Chinese coast, USS Portsmouth and the Levant had received news of the beginning of the war. These two sloops of war were tasked with protecting American lives. 
and they landed a 150-man detachment of Marines and sailors in Canton. After peaceful landing, the Americans occupied the city. A third ship, the U.S. San Jacinto, arrived in Canton's harbor. So, for about a month, the Americans occupied the city. In November, after a brief stay, no military contact, the force withdrew from the city. But during the withdrawal, the American commander, Andrew Foote, paddled out to his ship, and as he did, he passed the two Pearl River forts, which were guarding Canton. The Chinese garrison there fired on the small American boats. The reaction in 1856 is the same as if you fired on a Navy ship today. Oh no, you didn't. Neutral doesn't mean there are no rules. So retaliation was planned at the same time the Chinese began reinforcing the forts. The order was given. The commander of the fleet there decided to take such measures as his judgment would dictate even the capture of the forts. There were four forts in the Pearl River guarding the city of Canton. On the 20th of November, the crews from these three ships took the first fort by leading an amphibious assault with 300 men. Then they silenced the second fort by turning the cannons from the first fort on it. Once taking the second position, the Chinese launched several counterattacks with some 3,000 Qing army soldiers. In a few more days of intense combat, the U.S. force, with help from the guns from the ships, pushed back the attacking Chinese army, wounding dozens of the attackers, and then captured two more of Pearl River's forts and spiking 176 enemy guns in the process. Chinese casualties, 500 killed and wounded. The Americans had 10 killed and 32 wounded. In four days, all four of the forts were captured. The Levant, close in through most of the action, received the major part of the bombardment, 22 shot holes in her hull and rigging, but she was still seaworthy. After this battle, the U.S. concluded a peace with the Qing Emperor, and with the exception of one other action where a U.S. ship helped with the bombardment of these forts again, U.S. involvement in the Second Opium War was over. Kelly C. Ward asks in the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics site, is this another example of a president losing during wartime? Because the Second Opium War begins under Pierce and it ends under Buchanan, the U.S. 1856 to 1858, and Pierce was defeated for renomination by his own party. Well, it's something to look at. Franklin Pierce, young senator from New Hampshire, received the nomination of his party in 1852 and defeated Winfield Scott, the Whig candidate, became president, was not the most popular president. He did try to get renominated in the Cincinnati Convention of 1856 of the Democratic Party. He entered upon a three way tug of war between Pierce, President, Senator Stephen Douglas, and James Buchanan. In the end of the day, the Kansas Nebraska Act had ripped apart the Northern Democratic Party. James Buchanan had the advantage of being away in the court of St. James, the ambassador to Great Britain, and thus he didn't have to take any position on the domestic issues and the politics of the day. He had a lot of experience, too. He was Secretary of State under Polk, and his forces were more organized at the convention. Pierce lost his party's nod. It was given to Buchanan. Now, the trouble with this, as an example of swapping horses, is that this Cincinnati convention occurred in early summer, and so Pierce was already out well before the fireworks began in Canton in the fall. It could not have been part of the decision not to renominate Pierce. And James Buchanan running on the same party banner as Pierce won the general election in 1856. I would also say that the Second Opium War, although it did involve Americans fighting directly with Chinese and did involve American casualties, was not a well-known war in the forefront of American opinion and so was not influencing politics. Kelly C. Ward also notes, the quasi-war with France. Adams missed re-election. The American people replaced him with Jefferson before the conflict was technically ratified by both countries on December 21st, 1801. The quasi-war with France. Okay, well, that's another one to consider. A couple things about that. John Adams did lose the election in 1800. Of that, there's no doubt. But was the country at war? There's a little doubt there. The answer is in the name that we call that war now. We were sort of at war. It was an undeclared war. It was a naval war, which involved our navy, but also privateer ships, the taking of French ships and French privateer ships. 
was mostly fought on the seas. At one point, however, a ground force, an army of the United States, was assembled and John Adams as president ordered that George Washington be given the commander-in-chief role. George Washington promptly asked that Alexander Hamilton be his inspector general and, in effect, in charge of the United States Army. Adams didn't like it, but grudgingly accepted. But by the time of Adams' re-election in 1800, Washington was dead. Hamilton, for his part, was no longer commander of the U.S. Army after June 1800. The ground force was largely disbanded, for it was not needed. President Adams began negotiating with France to try to resolve their differences at the time of the election. Indeed, these negotiations were more to blame for the loss of Adams' federalist support than the war with France itself. That peace would not come until after the election, so John Adams unfortunately missed out on a a good opportunity for a foreign policy victory that might have boosted his election. So, tough call with the quasi-war of France. I still think it hints as to what is the overall truth of this question. U.S. voters will swap horses. They are not bound to vote for the executive in a time of war. Just such a defeat hasn't clearly happened yet. If the war is going well or average, I think it helps the incumbent. If the country's at war, there's more of a focus on the leader. And there's a risk factor with changing stewardship. But if the war is going badly, you see those party switches. You see those midterm results. You see presidents declining to run again. I think American voters will gladly dump an incumbent during a war at some future time. Don Vincent writes, Bruce, I would be very interested to get your take on this. And it is an article from uh, radio commenter Tom Hartman. He wrote an article that the second was mostly designed to protect the slave patrols of the southern states. And thus, the Second Amendment, cherished by so many Americans, is secretly a defense of slavery. The article was widely distributed. Here's his main point. States with large slave populations feared slave revolts, and they took military steps to ensure those revolts didn't happen. Very often people were asked, with so many black slaves in the South, with their populations so large, particularly in the states of South Carolina, Georgia, there were revolts, but how come there was never a revolt that really took fire, and how come blacks didn't earn their own freedom in that manner? There was this military solution that Hartman's talking about. In Georgia, for example, a generation before the American Revolution, laws were passed in 1755 and 1757 that required all plantation owners or their male white employees to be members of the Georgia militia, and for those armed militia members to make monthly inspections of quarters of all slaves in their states. The law defined which counties had which armed militias, and even required armed militia members to keep a keen eye out for slaves who may be planning uprisings. So it wasn't just the responsibility of the individual slave owner, it was the responsibility of the state. Hartman then cites the speech at the Virginia Ratifying Convention for the Constitution where Patrick Henry, a fierce opponent of the Constitution, brings this issue up. His fault with the Constitution was, If the country be invaded, a state may go to war, but cannot suppress slave insurrections under this new constitution. If there should happen to be an insurrection of slaves, the country cannot said to be invaded. They cannot therefore suppress it without the interposition of Congress. In this state, he said, talking about Virginia, there are 230,000 blacks, and there are many more in several other states, but there are few or none in the northern states. Thus, Patrick Henry linking his problem with the Constitution, and the problems with the Constitution would eventually lead to those amendments in the Bill of Rights, linking it directly to fear of insurrection from slaves. Big fan of Tom Hartman and his use of history. I think it's important, and he's one of the people out there who are discussing history in terms of the politics today, but I still think in many cases he's leading history to conclusions rather than letting history lead him. I'm happy to comment on this because it gives me a chance to talk about this rare profession of applied history, applying history to the events of today. It's dangerous, and you have to do it right. I think any of us will have a little bias of some sort, but I also think you can avoid the blatant stuff by not entering historical research with a point of view, but letting it lead you a bit. You might always have your point of view, but be willing to be challenged and to change your point of view as you do more and more research. Tom Hartman happens to be looking at history with a left point of view, 
There are others who will do the same on the right. In my opinion, Henry was an opponent of the Constitution, and you have to look at it this way. He was using the angle that he thought would get Virginians most riled up. Don't pass this Constitution or you'll be trapped in a slave revolt with no answer but to rely on the North to save you. He was a slave owner, but no proponent, consistently opposed what he called the abominable practice. Not unlike Jefferson, he's conflicted, even though he was a slave owner and hoped for a day when the practice would be ended. If that were, though, the only part of the problem with Hartman's argument, Henry's lack of devotion to the slavery cause in reality, then it would still be debatable, and Hartman still may be right. The weakness would be here. Sure, for the southern states, you might argue that support for an amendment supporting gun rights included the slave patrols and the militia designed to prevent slave insurrections. But you'd have to explain why New Hampshire and New York, with just a few slaves and no slave patrols, insisted on the Second Amendment as a condition of their approval of the Constitution. I mean, insisting on a protection for the right to keep and bear arms as a condition of their approval of the Constitution. That's New York and New Hampshire with nothing to do with these type of slave patrols. And then when you, you start to get into 1688 and the Glorious Revolution and the Bill of Rights of William and Mary and that Englishmen had a express right to keep and bear arms, that there's a lot more to this than just the slavery issue. Paul Sumner writes, Bruce, can you shed some light on claims that Texas is a republic and not really a state in our union and that it can legally secede at any time? If this is true, what would be required within Texas law to make this happen? What is its likelihood and what ramifications do you envision? Well, I think people forget when they ask this question is that Texas already did try to leave the Union in 1861 and was brought back in. And they sent in a particular person with tens of thousands of troops. His name was George A. Custer. He was stationed at Austin after the Civil War, and he expressed the military view when he recommended that the army retain control of Texas until the government was satisfied that a loyal sentiment prevails in at least a majority of the state. When the state of Texas was admitted to the Union, the act of Congress that allowed them in did not allow them to secede. This is something that's just a misunderstanding now and exploited by Texas politicians sometimes. The Act of Congress didn't allow them to secede, but allowed them to split into five parts, five different states. This actually was added to the bill admitting Texas in order to calm northern congressmen who were a little worried about adding a new slave state to the Union and wanted at least the possibility that there might be parts of that state could, that could be a new free state. So this language was added in. It has never been acted on. The right to split into five states is actually true of any state. See, California could do it. The only provision in the Constitution is the Congress has to agree, and if you make a new state out of a state that exists, the state has to agree through its legislature. So, so it's nothing really particular to Texas, and it's nothing that anyone's going to act on. With no likelihood, I'm not going to discuss ramifications. It's just too what ify uh, Speaking of what ify Stephen Laub writes on Twitter, at my hist. That is our Twitter account, by the way. Hope you'll sign up and follow me. Stephen Lobb writes, McCain would have survived full first term had he won. Quoting me, could it be that the stress of the presidency would have been greater than in the Senate? So he's making a note that I, in discussing age in the presidency, had said that in 2008, I was making the point that this issue of McCain's age is not really the big issue. It should be. He's probably going to survive the four years, advanced medical science and the like. So could the stress of the presidency be greater than the Senate? Well, perhaps. But what we know is that McCain's still alive now. And, of course, we wish him the best, whatever our views on politics are. The stress of the presidency is intense. But, you know, his Senate time isn't without pressures either, I'm sure. And keep in mind that he did recently face a tough primary in his state, which would have brought a lot of stress. But I think also that while the presidency creates a lot of stress, you also have probably the best medical care and observation in the world. I think really the point I want to make is that in 2008, there was a lot of talk. Like, if you elect this person, we're going to end up with uh, Sarah Palin, say, as, as president, because that wasn't, I believe, an accurate statement given medical science. 
I want to thank you for listening. The Twitter is at my hist. I'm going to be doing another question and answer soon. Follow me, please. The website is myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. There you can find a link to the archive with hours and hours of podcasts on lots of political and history topics. Twenty-five ninety-nine. Some of the things I addressed today, for instance, about that five states of Texas, already in the archive. The swapping horses, already in the archive. Lots of other issues. Twenty-five ninety-nine. Hours and hours and hours of podcast. If you like the program, please tell someone about it. Would love a review on iTunes. Very helpful. If you're listening on Stitcher, thank you very much. Please favorite us or just post a note about us on your blog. Thanks for listening.